Hello there, girls, boys, and as always, others. Today, we are looking at the halogens, yes, but in a slightly different context. We're looking at chlorine-based compounds found in bleach. So one of the uses of chlorine that most people are aware of is chlorine is used as a cleaning agent, very regularly in the form of bleach. If we were in school, we would be doing a practical with this to determine how cost effective the bleach is in terms of the number of moles of bleach molecules or our chlorine molecules that are present within that solution. Now, unfortunately, because we're not in school, we can't do that. So what we're going to have to do for now is have a look at the method itself um, and then do the follow up with the calculations. Hopefully when we get back to school, we will have a chance to do this experiment. It is a great example of titrations uh, and what is called an indirect titration. So the specification points that we are looking to cover today, we are looking uh, for techniques and procedures in iodine thiosulfate titrations. I'll come on to that properly in a moment. And the idea in the second bit there of the efficient use of atoms in a reaction or in a product. Okay, so when we're doing this in school, what we do is we get three different brands of bleach, um, usually like the shop's own one, one of the uh, big selling ones, for example, Parazone or Domestos, and then one sort of middle of the range. Now, we have a problem in doing a titration with bleach, with quite a few problems, in fact, and most of these you'll come to realise as you do the sort of follow up questions. Let's have a look at the equation to see what some of these problems might be. So as it says here, the active ingredient that we're actually looking for, the, the chlorine bit of it, is actually sodium chlorate 1, uh, which is sometimes called sodium hypochlorate in the older sort of language. We've looked at the Roman numerals, the systematic naming and the old fashioned language earlier on in this unit. This compound, the sodium hypochlorate, is prepared by getting uh, elemental chlorine and reacting it with sodium hydroxide, an alkali there. And then what you get, a slight bit of a displacement reaction there. So the uh, hydrogen on the hydroxide is booted out. So you get one sodium atom bonded to one oxygen, bonded to one chlorine. That's the sodium hypochlorite. Uh, you get sodium chloride, i.e. salt, and water, H2O. So the bleach is going to be a mixture of those three things there. The problem none of those we can particularly see easily. They are all colourless when in solution and they would all be in solution. So we cannot do necessarily um, a direct titration. Now you know in titrations we use indicators when the solutions are colourless. Yeah, obviously. So with our alkalis we might use um, the phenylphalan solution. We could use methyl orange. We could use a few different indicators there. But none of those product on that right hand side there will actually form anything with any of our traditional indicators. So what we have to do instead is another reaction. So this is what we call an indirect titration because we're not directly titrating one thing with another. We are doing a secondary reaction to get a secondary product which will be in a molar ratio with the product that we actually are testing for. And the property that we're going to use here is the idea that the sodium chlorate is a great oxidizing agent. Because it's a powerful oxidizing agent, we can use that to do some displacement reactions, potentially with the other halogens or halides. If we had some sort of iodide solution, for example, potassium iodide or something along those lines, and we reacted it with our bleach solution, there would be a displacement reaction to make iodine and the chloride ions. So the iodine we can actually test for the presence of. From your biology knowledge, uh, assuming that you do biology, how do you test, or, or let's think of it the other way around, what does iodine test for? Iodine in biology is the test for the presence of starch. So if you test a solution with iodine and it goes blue-black, that proves to you that starch is present. What we're going to do in this case is the same reaction, but the other way around. So instead of using the iodine to test for starch, we're going to use the starch to test for the presence 
of iodine. So in this case, starch is going to be our indicator. So what you would do is take that solution with the iodine ions present and you add your starch, it should go the blue black. And then what we'll do is we're going to react it with a sodium thiosulfate solution. You've probably used that before in the disappearing cross experiment, very common back at GCSE level. We titrate it with sodium thiosulfate. We will be going from a black, blue black solution and it will slowly be going colourless as the iodine is converted into iodide ions and there is an oxidation state change there. So the main aim of the experiment is to, if we're in school anyway, uh, to check that you can prepare a dilution. We'll have to do that another time. Check that you know how to carry out an iodine titration. We'll still have a go at that. Um, and this is the main point that we will be looking at is, can you do the concentration calculation, the titration calculation from this experiment? OK, so this is the method that we would be following if we were doing this in lesson. Step one is how we prepare the dilutions. Uh, it does say there, ensure the sample is thoroughly mixed, not shaken. Uh, are there any ideas why it might not want to be shaken? Well, bearing in mind this is coming from bleach, um, a lot of bleaches have what we call foaming agents, so things to make it go bubbly. Uh, so the last two years when we've done this experiment in school, when people have shaken the mixture, you get lots of bubbles uh, and then with the bubbles you can't tell where the meniscus lies so if you're making it up to a volumetric flask you can't do it accurately because you can't tell where your meniscus is. Step two and three are about completing the little equations that we saw just a few moments ago. Um, the sulfuric acid there does have a specific purpose I'll leave that for your imagination for now I do believe that comes up in the follow-up questions. You get your sodium thiosulfate solution into the burette, you titrate it, adding just one to two centimetre cubed of the starch solution when the solution just becomes straw coloured. Now, unless some people have found this really, really tricky, because what we are doing there is the sodium thiosulfate is going to start neutralising any excess things that are left over there. And if you add the starch before this point, now because the starch is a biological molecule, it is very, very sensitive to changes in pH. So if you add the starch too early, the proteins within the starch or the, the biological structures within the starch will be denatures and it will not work as an indicator. So you have to start neutralising your solution earlier and just when it starts going to a very strawish, yellowish colour, then you add your starch solution and it's usually about a centimeter cubed after that uh, that the end point is reached but you've got to go really slowly just in case because you know those end points are always a little bit tricky there the rest of the stages are the usual for the titration uh, lather rinse repeat and keep repeating until you get concordant results OK, then. So on the screen, you should be able to see the results that we achieved for this titration in the class of 2018. What you need to do is have a go at calculating the titer for each one and therefore the concentration of the bleach molecules within each of the different samples. If you fancy an extra challenge or if you are aiming for A's, A stars, I would strongly advise also having a look at the results from 2019. Now the 2019 results were very interesting because we used the exact same samples just a year apart and the difference in results is very interesting and might actually lead you to make some different conclusions about which bleach is the most effective. If you are struggling knowing how to start those sorts of uh, titration calculations, here are some stages that might help guide you through it. Those results and a quick breakdown of the stages of the calculation are shown on this document here. I will send this to my students over Edmodo. Um, if you are not one of my students and happen to have come across this channel, um, or if you're a teacher who wants access to these resources, just head over to my TES page and you can download all of these completely for free. So ladies, gents, girls, boys and others, what you need to do is basically go off and do those calculations. Once you've completed them, there are a few questions for you to consider. And the questions on the type of error, um, there are some follow-up resources to this in this PowerPoint that you can see here. 
So for definitions for different types of errors, I've copied and pasted these from a range of websites. The website address is at the bottom there. I do not claim to have written these. These are completely belonging to uh, this one in this case is for a, a physics website. Uh, these are from GCSE websites. So you do need to be aware of different types of error in chemistry and how they might affect your results. So that is it for now. Ladies, gents, girls, boys and others, go away and do your titration calculations uh, and I'll send you my worked examples when you've had a go at them. That'll do for now. Be gone, minions of science, be gone!